I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. It was a clear-cut condemnation, more comprehensive and scathing than many expected. In her final report into the robo-debt policy disaster, Royal Commissioner Catherine Holmes didn't hold back. She says it's remarkable how little interest there was in the scheme's legality, how rushed its implementation was, and how little thought was given to the impact on welfare recipients who were unlawfully chased down for debts they didn't owe. Former coalition ministers have come in for sharp criticism, with some of the strongest findings made against former Prime Minister Scott Morrison. They've all defended their actions and don't believe they're in the sealed section of the report, which refers some individuals to police and the Anti-Corruption Commission for further action. Senior public servants, however, may have more to fear on that front. Later, I'll be joined by the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Linda Burney, at the end of a big week for the Indigenous Voice. First, the panel, Phil Curry, Laura Tingle and John Paul Janke. Paul Janke, welcome to the couch and welcome all of you to the new Canberra studio. Good to be home. It's hey, good, to be here, yeah. good to be here. In fact, there's a lot of, um, a lot of history <coughs> in this studio that we're in. Uh, in 1983, after winning the election, Bob Hawke came here to this studio to give his first uh, national uh, his address to the nation. There it is. All those years ago. <laughs> so plenty of political history in this uh, studio and a, and a bit more still to be made. Look at the fanfare. Big thanks. <laughs> Look at that. Big thanks Look to all those who've uh, helped with this uh, studio in place for us over the last couple of weeks. Right, let's get into robo sure. Laura, what did we learn from this uh, comprehensive Royal Commission report about how this was designed, put in place, and, and, and particularly why all those warning bells over the years were ignored? Well, I think the Royal Commission report really uh, documents a collapse in our system of government, um, you know, from uh, and as a result of that culture of uh, beating up dole bludgers um, and downward envy, which is a feature of Australian politics going back to the First Fleet. Um, but uh, it really, I mean, it, it is, we, sh we say shocking a lot um, in, in journalism, but it, for somebody who's been around for 40 years, it, it's unbelievable when you just go through and look at each individual uh, aspect of this. You know, the, uh, you know, we've seen the summaries of it but how uh, public servants deliberately hid things, deliberately didn't want to know about things, uh, politicians didn't want to know either. Um, I think, I, I, I just find, I, I, I've sort of, I was left speechless on yeah. Friday, well, except I had to say something, but I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, it is such an extraordinary episode uh, and not in a good way in terms of just documenting how our public service has been corrupted um, not just our politics, but our public service has been corrupted and been made, rendered uh, completely incompetent uh, and venal. And I want, I want to come to some of those um, elements of this for the public service, uh, you know, what, what this says about the public service and what's likely to change. But just on the former ministers, uh, Alan Tudge, Christian Porter, Stuart Robert, all come in for uh, criticism, but Scott Morrison, particularly the former PM, uh, the Commissioner said that he, he failed to meet his ministerial responsibility to ensure that Cabinet was properly informed about what the proposal actually entailed and to ensure that it was lawful. It also found that some of his evidence was untrue. Phil, where does that leave Scott Morrison? Oh, look, c completely compromised. I mean, he, he's damaged, you know, sort of severely damaged by all this. Uh, um, he lies about things. Well, but the um, but the fact he's still in the parliament, I think, you know, well, everyone else who's been named in this report isn't, you know, keeps the spotlight on him and makes it a problem for the go uh, for the opposition more so than um, <clears throat> the others. Uh, but. Look, he's put out, a, Morrison's put out a defence, sort of yeah, he, denying I mean, a lot of this stuff. But Yeah, he says he's, yeah. he's rejected the findings yeah. against him. He says they're wrong, unsubstantiated and contradicted by yeah. clear documentary evidence but uh, I, presented. Yeah, I, I guess what we don't know, Dave, is, is Morrison one of those subject to the adverse findings as we are in the sealed section. We don't know whose name. Because, I suspect yeah. it must be. But because Tudge, uh, Alan Tudge and Stuart Roberts said they weren't not, given a heads up yeah. about being in that that yeah. sealed section, but Scott Morrison did... Yeah, but whether that, that what you raised at the start there, about whether he's, you know, he, he's perjured himself for the inquiry or whatever that the Commissioner is it's suggesting, untrue. that maybe, you know, the, those consequences may be played out through an adverse finding. I, thought, I, I don't know, but we're, we're guessing a lot here. But, 
you know, he's now the sort of the face of it, and he's still sitting in the parliament. Um, so even just from a political standpoint, it's it's a. Yeah. Yeah, but you think it's... about how, like, I mean, you mentioned three of them, David, but you know, Michael Keenan, Christian Porter, Maurice Payne, they're all all also under scrutiny now. Some of them came off okay out of it, you know, or, or yeah. you know, without better any than others. Yeah. better than others. Um, but you think about the size of the cabinet and how many people were involved in this, how many people had a view of this in a direct ministerial sense and nobody did anything mm. and I suppose the thing that um, I would just observe about the sealed section is it's fascinating interesting all that stuff but you don't actually have to go to that you just have to read the Royal Commission's report and actually sort of see yeah. this documentation I mean Scott Morrison says you know there's evidence to the contrary well Actually, there's quite a lot of evidence just in the report, which and well, people can make up their own minds. Just, sorry, just sort of yeah. broader to that point, you know, I mean, not just the ministers who had direct oversight of this, but the whole cabinet. I mean, there was questions in Parliament, there was reports, there were allegations being made. You know, th this happened under two or three prime ministers. You know, uh, where was the broader curiosity in the cabinet? You had ministers you know, with Malcolm Turnbull and others. Yeah. He was prime minister under his watch. This began. Uh, other treasurers like Josh Frydenberg and so people who weren't directly involved. But where was the is this lawful? Where, where was the well, broader on, rigour in the cabinet? Just on the reaction that we're hearing from, uh, you know, Scott Morrison, and I mentioned the other former ministers who've rejected a lot of uh, what the commission has found. Um, Anthony Albanese points out there's not a lot of contrition there. Scott Morrison uh, has also shown no contrition whatsoever uh, for the impact uh, that his actions as minister have had. And I do note very serious findings of the Royal Commissioner about uh, his evidence before the Royal Commission. Yeah, look, JP, the PM's not suggesting Scott Morrison necessarily needs to leave the parliament. He's not going that far. Uh, he's being a little careful on that front. But does he have a point about the need for some level of contrition? Yeah, absolutely, because I think in the end we need to remember that this program, people lost their lives over this program. Um, and I think, you know... I thought of the mothers and the fathers when this report was handed down who, who lost children over, you know, debts that weren't there. Um, and as parents ourselves, we know what position that puts our children in, that people actually lost their lives over this. The other thing I say is that politicians will play politics with this over the next couple of weeks, um, which they need to remember that fellow Australians lost their lives over this program. The other thing is that at the moment we're talking about a voice and we're talking about, you know, advisory bodies. There's two levels here. If this program was run by ATSIC, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, in the day, it would be abolished again. But yet no one's talking about the <laughs> Department of Human Services. It's you know, point. leaders and CEOs yeah, would yeah. be yeah. criminally Absolutely. charged. Yeah. No one is talking about that. Um, uh, look, th this sealed section, though, is, is fascinating because it is a little unusual to have a Royal Commission have a confidential sure. section about who's being referred to. And they've said, well, they haven't told us how many people uh, or who's in it, but they have said being referred to the Federal Police the criminal prosecution uh, or consideration of prosecution, the National Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, as well as the Public Service um, Code of Conduct inquiries that will follow for members of, um, of the public service. Look, Bill Shorten, who, you know, let, let's, let's face it, he's done more than most to um, mm. really mm. push for this uh, whole pursuit of, of this well, policy so. mm. disaster. Uh, he was a little conflicted, it sounded like, uh, about having the confidential, confidentiality around those who are being referred. When I first read the uh, Commissioner Holmes's letter, I had conflicting emotions. Because I know lots of people out there who feel that, will anyone ever get punished? But to put not too elegant a point on it to the people who worry about that, there are adverse findings, there are bodies who are now being asked with a brief of evidence to look at these matters. There will be accountability. Yeah, Phil, looking back at Royal Commissions, mm. uh, the Trade Union Royal Commission, <coughs> they named people who were being referred, mm. didn't end up with a lot of prosecutions, I think only one, but they named the people yeah. they were... What do you make of keeping... Oh, look, I, I think the, the sentiment Mr Shorten there expressed is entirely understandable, but I can also understand why the Commissioner herself, you know, I think as a society we've shown we're not very good at, you know, not prejudicing criminal proceedings when there's a lot of public interest and if, if it's a... You know, if, if she puts these names out in the public and it all becomes political and kicked around on social media and yeah. prejudices the prospect of any actual real action. 
But yeah, you know, I, 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 I am a bit wary. I go back to the Hain Royal Commission into the banks. Remember the villains in the banks who ripped everyone off? Uh, we had another Bill Shorten initiative, by the way, pushing for that one. Um, but Kenneth Hain, actually, I think he referred a handful of people kept it secret to the to the regulators for further action. Now you remember. ASIC then bulked up, employed Daniel Crenn in the QC, who was the guy who was going to come in and, you know, mm. there's going to be, we were assured people were going to be swinging before the next election. And I don't think anyone ever, anything ever came of that in the end. It all sort of fizzled. There was a couple of resignations from NAB. Uh, Ken Henry and the CEO, Dave yeah. stepped down. That was more out of just, you know, mm. embarrassment. But nothing ever sort of came of it. So if there is action to be taken here, I think it has to be followed through. Well, there has to be full accountability as to why nothing's going to happen and people... But, you know, we can't just... This can't just dissipate. No, I, well, we'll see what happens. On the public service, Laura, um, mentioned Catherine Campbell. She was the head of the Human Services Department. She's now in a uh, high-paid role at Defence, working on the AUKUS uh, project. We just heard she's taken leave, um, certainly in senior levels of the government. They don't think she'll have a long time left in the, in the public service after these findings. What does it tell us more broadly, though, about the public service this whole episode? Well, um, as I said earlier, it's, it's, it's about uh, sort of the, the, the cowering of the public service and about its incompetence. Um, and uh, and th they're sort of two unrelated issues in a way. But once again, the fact that nobody in, in, the, in the senior echelons of these departments apparently could find a way of going, oh, I mean, they got advice before this even went to Cabinet that it was illegal, and yet it went for four or five years, and apart from some brave whistleblowers, nobody at the top of either department, human services and social services, seemed to stop it. Even when they got advice at the end, the secretary of um, the department sat on it for five weeks before she closed it down, which the commissioner said had happened, not Stuart Robert. Um, I, I just think the sort of sense of what public servants are there for has been lost in this. And there was that uh, great line of uh, the commissioners that um, her recommendation was that the Department of Human Services, her, one of her first recommendations was it should actually service Consider humans effectively. Serving, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and just, it seems to be a last order issue. Yeah. yeah, and just going back to the point about former um, uh, Royal Commissions, I mean, just to keep this in context, this affected, I mean, JP says, you know, it, a few people died. 500,000 mm. Australians were affected by this. Mm. Half a million people. And yet nobody did anything. Even when people started to say, oi, you know, th th this is all wrong. Nobody did anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah one, of the, one of the important things I think about the public service and the culture in the public service is that this report showed that people were deliberately giving verbal briefings and not writing anything down. Um, yeah, that's an interesting Which point. says a big yeah. shift in the way that our public services is operating. Avoiding the paper trial. Yeah. Which has been, yeah. which has been to, to be fair, uh, has been happening really mm. since the beginning of FOI, the Freedom of Information Laws. People have increasingly done that. But it certainly deteriorated under the Howard government where a system was put in place where the cabinet, or, you know, a submission would come from the department and ministers' offices wouldn't stamp it as received and they'd send it back and say, I don't think you actually meant to say that. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, we'll see if that uh, if changes. Uh, all right, well, time to shift to the voice debate now. <coughs> Talk to the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Linda Burney. And during the week, the Minister announced four priority areas she'd be asking the voice to focus on. Health, education, housing and jobs. But the opposition leader says there's no limit on what the voice can provide inf uh, advice on. The problem is but it goes much further than what she's suggesting today. And this continuous misleading of the Australian public by Minister Burney is only making a bad situation worse for the yes case. Uh, as we know from the hand-picked people on the referendum working group, hand-picked by the Prime Minister, they're out there saying that the voice by design will have an influence on every element of government work. It'll influence the way in which we make decisions in the cabinet process, uh, that's just the design of it. Linda Burney, welcome to the program. Thanks, David. So you've listed four priority areas you'd like The Voice to focus on, but won't it be up to The Voice to decide for itself what it wants to pursue? The priority areas that I've identified are health, housing, jobs, and of course, um, and of course housing. 
the really important, oh, sorry, education, mm. the really important thing to understand is that I have been involved in Aboriginal affairs for 44 years. I've travelled this country extensively and they are the persistent issues that are raised with me. The relationship that I want with The Voice is a two-way process, David, one of respect, uh, one of listening to fresh ideas about intractable problems. The issues around, uh, obviously, baby birth weights, the issues around life expectancy, of course, are important. But let's look at the uh, community development program. It's a jobs program. It's affecting a 1,000 communities. Uh, and it is failing. It is absolutely failing. And not one size fits all 1,000 communities. Those are the points I was making. Mm. I'm just trying to get a sense uh, for the viewers of how this works if the voice gets up at the referendum. Would you as minister be advising the voice on what they should be advising you on? Uh, the voice is about two things. It's about making a practical difference to the shocking social justice outcomes for Aboriginal people. And of course, it's about that wonderful unifying aspect of recognising 65,000 years of truth, of story, of history in our constitution. David, I was 10 years old in 1967 when uh, we were counted after a successful referendum and the Commonwealth got the responsibility for Aboriginal affairs. So this is... Uh, this is something that's come from Aboriginal people. It is something that Aboriginal people have been asking for from as far back as the 1930s. The relationship will be one, as I said, based on trust, based on a two-way process. And I can assure people watching us this morning uh, that the issues that The Voice will be focused on are issues that worry, worry people watching this show, the disparity, uh, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. But by setting these priorities, are you indicating this is where you might legislate the voice should or shouldn't um, uh, go? Would you put these sort of priorities, health, education, housing, jobs, into legislation as to what you'd like the voice to do? Uh, the point that I made just previously, it will be a two-way process. Uh, it will be something based on trust. Um, and I have held in the past uh, a position in an, in an advocacy body and know how important it is to work collaboratively uh, with the government to raise issues with the government that the government needs to hear. But remember, this voice is not just about advising the government. It's also about advising the parliament. So if there's legislation, for example, coming through the parliament that directly affects Aboriginal people, the parliament could seek the views of the voice. Uh, there is nothing to lose from this proposal, but there is so much to gain. Just on this legislation question, though, you'll have to legislate the voice after the referendum if it gets up. Would that include yes. the, the, the remit of the voice, the areas that it can and can't cover? Uh, the legislation that you're referring to, particularly for our viewers this morning, is after the referendum, mm. which will be asking you uh, to, uh, to protect a voice in the Constitution mm. so it cannot be gotten rid of by the stroke of a pen. The legislation that will follow this will determine the composition of the voice, the functions of the voice, um, and, and ultimately the establishment of the voice. What about That's the scope, the though? I'm just asking, whether, would it be the scope as well of the areas, the issues that it can cover? The, the, the way that I, I see it as the Minister, David, is that that scope should be a respectful discussion with the voice. I have identified very clearly... What, what, what I have identified very clearly what I think the priorities are. But obviously there are, there are other mm. issues 
like baby birth weights, uh, like life expectancy. Okay. But I just really say to you very clearly, there is nothing to lose and there is everything to gain from the establishment okay. of the voice. But just, just to be clear on this two-way process you're talking about, you, you'd, you'd talk to the voice, they'd talk to you, but you're not going to legislate what they can and can't um, advise on. Uh, the Voice is an independent body uh, chosen by Aboriginal people uh, to represent their, their views and their voices in Canberra. And I will respect that independence. Um, look, you, you mentioned uh, some of the issues that you uh, believe The Voice will be interested in providing advice. And you gave a couple of practical examples too during the week at the Press Club, um, in improving school attendance in remote communities, uh, fixing the community development program you mentioned there on the jobs front, birthing on country. Uh, just give us a sense of how that works. So if the voice were to come to you as minister and say, we need more funding to encourage more birthing on country, what happens? Uh, well, a fantastic example of this is a place called Waminda in Nara that are in the process of developing a birthing on country program. But the way that it practically works, uh, David, is that we know that this is successful. When doctors listen to patients, they get better outcomes. When bosses listen to workers, they better outcomes. When policymakers listen to Aboriginal people, they get better outcomes. And we know that where birthing on country has been in place, that there has been a, a halving of, uh, of early, early deliveries, in fact, premature babies, in other words. It means involving culture. It means involving language. It means in involving the extended family. It is a very different way of doing business. And it makes, uh, it makes sure that Aboriginal women having babies are seeing uh, their Aboriginal midwife earlier and sooner and more often during pregnancies. And it's a two-way process also. It means that those institutions that deliver babies become more familiar with uh, the Aboriginal women that they're working with and can take into a consideration things like uh, when a baby's born in the Aboriginal community, certain procedures, certain, uh, certain cultural aspects are taken care of. That's a practical example, but think about this, David, that in the education space, there is at least a three, one to three year gap with young children in literacy and numeracy. And that gap gets wider mm -hmm. as that young person gets older. And we had, we had just last year, only 57% of Aboriginal children or young people finishing high school and over 80% of, uh, of the rest of the community. That is a gap that I would expect The Voice to be able to advise okay, on, the process on how here, we close the, that gap. Just the process here, would, would you as Minister put more weight on advice from The Voice than advice from your own department? Uh, look, the, that is a hypothetical, but thank you for it. Um, obviously, you listen to your own department. But the way in which we're looking at Aboriginal affairs uh, under Anthony Albanese, Albanese's leadership is the way that it should be, that Jason Clare is responsible for mm. education. So I'd be speaking with uh, Jason Clare and he'd be getting advice, but obviously yeah, no, understandably, we'd be but, seeking but on, advice from The Voice. OK, but on something like birthing on country uh, or the jobs issues you're talking about, if The Voice says one thing and your department says another, what do you as Minister do? Uh, well, uh, I have enormous experience, as you know. Uh, I would be listening to, to both uh, and trying to um, make sure that what, what goes forward mm. is what will work for Aboriginal young people in school. Uh, this is not complex. I mean, I am in um, Launceston today and will be... Uh, door knocking with Bridget Archer this afternoon. I'm speaking tomorrow afternoon with Peter Gutwin at the University of Tasmania. 
and it's about listening to people. It's about showing respect. Mm. And as I say, this is about bringing ideas forward that make a practical difference to the lives of Indigenous people and everyone agrees that that needs to happen. You, you have said, you told Parliament the Voice won't be giving advice on changing Australia Day, but it could, couldn't it? The, I know Aboriginal Australia and I know that people know what the important issue is. Things like what I've identified, education, health, housing, jobs. And Josie Douglas, who is this remarkable Aboriginal woman uh, in the Central Land Council, put it perfectly. We are about changing lives, mm. not changing dates. I, I don't doubt that view is there, but it, it, can, it can provide advice on that issue, can't it? Uh, the voice I know will concentrate on issues to close the gap in this okay. country. David, we've got 19 targets and four are on track. That cannot be good for the mm. country and it's certainly not good for Aboriginal people. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on that ad that ran in the Financial Review during the week uh, from the No campaign. It depicted the West Farmers chairman, mm. um, Michael Cheney, handing a wad of cash to Yes campaigner Thomas Mayo, uh, uh, Kate Cheney, the independent MP, sitting on the knee of her father. Was this a racist ad in your view? Uh, this was universally and appropriately criticised. Totally unacceptable. And I think Matt Keane, uh, the uh, Shadow Health Minister in New South Wales, really nailed, nailed it, David, where he likened it to um, a racist trope from the Jim Crow days in America, but it was also incredibly sexist uh, and uh, it is uh, something, in the words of Matt Keane, the no, the no Camp has every right to have a say, but there are better ways of doing it. Final one on The Voice. If the referendum fails later this year, will you still seek to legislate The Voice so it can do all of the good things you're talking about this morning? Uh, the focus of myself and the government is absolutely on a successful referendum. It's why I'm down here in Tasmania. It's why I'm heading over to Western Australia on Monday night, going to Albany, Port Hedland and Kununurra. Uh, there, will be, there will be, in my view, uh, and I've, I've said this many times, I have enormous faith in the Australian people. And I don't say that because I'm supposed to say it. I say it because I really believe it. And I believe that this will be a successful referendum. OK, but if not, will you still legislate it? It will be a successful okay. referendum. Just finally, uh, Linda Burney on robo debt um, and the Royal Commission report. As, as the report notes, you as Shadow Minister uh, for Human mm. Services wrote to Alan Tudge, this was way back in 2016, uh, raising concerns, asking for the debt recovery action to be paused. It wasn't. Knowing what we know now, do you think there should be further consequences for the former ministers involved? I think there has to be consequences uh, for people involved. Like what? Uh, I, do, I don't know what's in the sealed section. Uh, but what I do know, David, is this, is that Labor had been raising these issues as far back as 2016. Uh, the Commissioner has said that this was cruel, it was unlawful, and it made innocent people feel like criminals. Um, and I spoke to so many people when I was the Shadow Minister for Human Services. We knew the algorithm was unjust and unfair and that there was no human involvement in it. Uh, this is a shocking indictment of, uh, of it not being uh, stopped uh, and it just, mm. it just says to me there has to be consequences. I can't articulate exactly uh, what they should be because I don't know what's in this seal section, mm. but the brave people that came forward 
uh, over this issue, I just say thank you. All right. Linda Burney, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, David. All right. Now, coming up, we're going to talk about the Reserve Bank's decision to leave rates on hold this week and the fate of Philip Lowe, the Reserve Bank Governor, as well. First, let's get back to the panel and explore further where things are at with The Voice. We're joined once again by Phil Curry, Laura Tingle and John Paul Janke. Uh, look, JP, just on the priority areas that the Minister put out there uh, this week, speaking at the National Press Club and explaining it a bit further this morning, why do you think the Minister is, is doing that, trying to articulate where she thinks The Voice should focus? Yeah, I think, importantly, her, her speech at the National Press Club was a way probably to reframe the debate and say that while there's a lot of noise about what things The Voice could concentrate on, whether it's Australia Day or submarine deals or closing beaches or changing the name of Queensland to a traditional name, it's refocusing the national conversation on these priorities. And the Minister is right. You know, she's worked for decades in Indigenous affairs and dating back to the 1930s... Uh, 1993, sorry, when, you know, ATSIC released a report called Recognition, Rights and Reform. Those were the priority areas and Linda Burney was on that consultative group that these areas of health, housing, education and employment feed into all those issues that they and want and to close the gap. that these are yeah. uh, priority areas, right? Uh, it, it's, I guess, about trying to get the right level of detail out there uh, around the voice without too much uh, detail? Yeah, I think, well, it's focusing back on these other key areas that Aboriginal people themselves have been asking for. I, I think there's a bit of a, a laughable situation here that if we're trying to confuse the debate by saying they will, the first priority will be changing Australia Day, mm. you know, normally around January 26 there's this national conversation about changing Australia Day, those that don't want to change it say, we're not hearing that in Aboriginal communities. Mm -hmm. Aboriginal people are not talking about changing no. January 26. But now they're saying that's what they're going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think it's got to be one or the other. Either people are talking about it or they're not talking about it. The, the, um, I mean, I suppose there are two things about this. One of them is it does bring it back to, you know, these crucial issues. Um, and also we've had, we've had the debate about legislation and, the, and uh, constitutional issues. But... One of the things about this is uh, the sort of more hysterical sort of aspects of a lot of this debate, you know, say they could make representations on anything. Well, you and I can make representations on anything if we want to. And I suppose the thing that strikes me about this is in those areas, you know, you say, well, why isn't it working? And it's a, once again, it's about the dysfunction of the way we do sh we do stuff for um, for uh, any community and I think a lot of white Australians don't understand that you know there, there are all sorts of levels of government involved in delivering services whether it's you know birthing on country whether it's uh, you know getting education into communities whether they're urban or, or remote um, and you need some sort of funnel and some sort of place that that sort of can give that feedback and sort of reconstruct things. I think for, for a lot of those programs that are community-led programs and programs that are initiated and started by Indigenous people in those communities, they probably feel their voice is not heard through the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So that rub between what the, what the bureaucracy says say, yeah. and what the community was is in the favour of the bureaucracy. So mm -hmm. I think this is a hope that it will what, bring what back, a, you know, yeah. advice. Yeah. What, what, what it, the reaction to Miss Burney's speech demonstrated to me was the... In, like a deliberate intransigence of the no campaign. So they be saying there's no detail, there's no detail. So the minister attempts to put some, you know, to address their key criticism, and then they go, oh, it's a con. <laughs> you know, she, she says, well, this is what it's sort of going to do, you know, and uh, and then they, then they then they then she gets bagged for giving the detail. It's sort of like the no campaign is always just just keep yeah. shifting the goalposts every time. Um, and yeah, the advocates what, what trying to address... Trying to, I mean, like, you, well, you've got 15 yeah. questions answered and you answer the question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What about what, that? One? I think listening to the Minister yeah. there, it's, it's clear that it, you know, she kept using this two-way conversation mm -hmm. argument. Mm -hmm. Government can suggest what it wants yeah. or Parliament can suggest what mm -hmm. uh, individual parliamentarians can suggest mm -hmm. what they'd like the voice to look at. It obviously can look at other issues and, you know, do its own thing, but, but there's going to be a bit of both. What it demonstrates, I think, is that you just, the Yes campaign is going to be butting its head against the No... Like, the No campaign is just going to give nothing on this, yeah. even if you try and please them. And, you know, <laughs> Albanese makes this claim that they're actually, they're actually not interested in having their questions answered. Just I think it, it, it just one. reframes the debate, right? If, you, if you believe that the Minister says these are the priority areas which Aboriginal people themselves mm. have been asking for for generations, or do you believe that those priority areas are an anonymous leaflet left in a Canberra uh, coffee shop that lists a lot of things that really aren't 
on Aboriginal people's radar. <laughs> Speaking of uh, the No campaign, I thought it was interesting too, we saw some shifting language uh, this week as well. Uh, Peter Dutton in particular, he went after corporate supporters mm. of The Voice and he called out one very well-known hardware chain in particular. Look at West Farmers. I think their $2 million would be better off uh, reducing prices in uh, their supermarkets or reducing prices at Bunnings. Uh, when I go to Bunnings, I want to pay less for my goods, not more. And I don't want to, every time I hand over my credit card or cash at Bunnings or at Coles, uh, I don't want part of that money going to an activist CEO. Activist CEOs, uh, elites, he had a go at Anthony Albanese in his Kirribilli mansion as well. It's, look, it's a populist pitch. Is it likely to work, do you think, JP? I don't think so. Look, it's quite disgraceful, the pitching of Aboriginal elites against other people. It's language that we should not be using in this respectful debate. I mean, framing 24 Aboriginal leaders as elite Aboriginal leaders is a disgrace. And it flows into a lot of conversations, you know, it flows into our mainstream media using the term ordinary Aborigines. It flows into cartoons like that appearing, you know, in the, in the financial review. Well, this, uh, this yeah. was the cartoon, in case anyone uh, missed it, the, um, uh, the cartoon that depicts the West Farmers chair. And this came uh, a day after Peter Dutton mentioned West Farmers. So there's the West Farmers chairman um, and Kate Cheney, his daughter, perched on his knee, handing the wad of cash to to Thomas Mayo, um, what, what, what was the impact of that? Oh, it's, it's disgraceful. Look, it flows in the, to, to narratives where you say that Aboriginal people can aspire to be leaders. They can, you know, spend their time working and protesting and marching on the street in the early days, but if they get to a certain level, they are put down, they are slapped down, you know, they are outside the box. It's, it's a term that a lot of Aboriginal people use, palleted, uh, you know, palatable black, that we yeah. are... There, but as long as we step outside the box, we are slapped whack. down. We are whacked down. The, the, the industrial or clinical, methodical hazing of anybody who emerges who is an articulate Indigenous leader, I find quite chilling. Yeah. And Thomas Mayo is the classic yeah. example of that. You know, he's a young leader. He, he hasn't been involved to the public mind in a lot of the previous debates. He's articulate. So what do they do? They absolutely just go for him. I mean, that ad was just disgusting. And um, I think it's fascinating that, um, you know, th there's all of that at attack going on in the, um, on the Indigenous leadership, but you have all this discussion about disgraceful activist uh, corporates. I don't remember the coalition being worried about corporate, uh, corporate activists during the mining tax debate, you know, or work any choices. work yeah. choices, any of these things. That's apparently OK. I mean... Really? Yeah. The, the, on the ad, um, mm. Warren Mundine from the No campaign um, defends it. Uh, the nine newspapers, we should point out, apologised for it. Mm. Um, the Yes campaign really leapt on it. Phil, do you think it was a, a bit of a turning point at all? Look, Dave, I was, I, I was on leave last week out in the regions and it didn't resonate out there at all, right? <laughs> so, but I think what it... And as, as an employee of the Financial Review, I didn't... I found it... Mm. Highly distasteful. Actually, my phone lit up like a Christmas tree on the yes. morning it appeared. <laughs> I'm going, what's going on here? Um, and I'm glad we, you know, we owned up to it and apologised as we should have. Um, but I think it was good that it was leapt upon with the venom it was leapt upon because you like it or not, there was an incredibly racist campaign going on out there. Yeah. Um, not, not. I'm not saying the, the, the official campaign, but they're spending time in the regions. There's a lot of racism out there. The, the, the anger towards the voice I find, especially in regional Australia, um, you know, is, is quite, quite, quite venomous and, and quite, quite upsetting. And so I think. If that element's being injected into this at, at a you know at a subterranean level, you've got to jump on it when you see it, even if you can be accused of overreacting, which in this case I don't think they were. Yeah, we, we've had a guest on the program who made a great comment about there are three campaigns going on at the moment. There's the Yes campaign, the No campaign, and there's a campaign of racism mm. going around. NITV, we've had to reduce our social media footprint because of just the racist trolling mm. uh, that is yeah. out there on The Voice. Um, and I think we're, we're the same as a lot of other organisations mm. and broadcasters and other institutions who, as soon as they post anything to do with Indigenous people, whether it's football, whether yeah. it's flags... Whether it goes it, off. The, yeah. It goes off yeah. and they suspend their comments mm. or close their comments. The national that, that wasn't happening a year ago. It wasn't happening a year ago. The National NAIDOC Committee, they did a great post uh, last week about their national awards where they just posted a photo of South Bank, uh, the beautiful architecture on South Bank, and said, we're hosting the awards tonight. 
mm. in Meange in Brisbane, they closed the comments because of the racism that they got where people were posting photos of chimpanzees. Yeah, and I, I'm finding it. Uh, just, just this whole debate yeah. has sort of reawakened the in awfulness in society yeah. that exists out there. And yeah. Some of the emails, you know, I'm not Indigenous, but just some of the emails and stuff you get at yeah. work just for writing about it or, or, yeah. or talking about it on shows like this. And in some way, it's mainstream media. We need to do better. We need to do better yeah. to lift this debate. Let's move to uh, the, well, a, a rare thing that happened this week. <laughs> Rates were kept on hold uh, by the Reserve Bank. Um, but for how long, who knows? It, it is seen as a fairly temporary reprieve, Laura. What's, the, what's happening next from here? What will the Reserve Bank be looking at? Well, everybody sort of you know, starts to un undo every single word that um, the Reserve Bank says on a day like this. I think um, I I've t tended to look at it comparing this uh, decision to put rates on hold with the, or to keep them on hold with the April decision. And I think you can clearly see um, what I would describe as a slightly more sort of high pitched alarm of, um, you know, it's a very narrow road we're, we're, we're treading now to avoid recession. Um, I think uh, the economics fraternity is um, is divided now between people who think we, if we, we might be able to escape a recession and those who don't. But without a doubt, the government is preparing for a recession. And, and there's no doubt that, yes, the government would have been relieved too to see rates on hold for, uh, for this month. But that cost of living pressure on the government is mm. only growing. I mean, we saw Anthony Albanese facing some tough questions on breakfast TV mm. uh, with stories about, you know, kids having to pinch uh, food from other classmates school yeah. bags because uh, they just don't have any themselves here he was well i know what it's like to do it tough nat and uh, for many families out there they are doing it tough and, and that's why uh, my government will work each and every day uh, to make a difference what are the prospects of any more cost of living relief later in the year do you think oh i think i think quite quite Realistic. I mean, we saw Chalmers last week pretty much went on target for a $19 billion surplus <laughs> for this financial year, up from the four they forecast in May. That immediately provoked these, you know, spend it calls from people. But I think the Treasurer quite wisely said, look, that money's better off sitting in the surplus for now. If we push it back into the economy, we're just going to make the inflationary situation worse. Mm -hmm. But they've convinced themselves they can help at the margins, as they did in the last budget, without putting too much pressure on inflation. And the Reserve Bank Governor backed them in on that with the power price deductions and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I'd, you know, I'd, I think I'd, I would be very surprised if in the mid-year financial statement, which comes out in December or at the earliest or maybe the next budget, there'll Remember, be another round of help, I would suspect. Yeah, at least inflation is starting to trend down, but it's still way too high. Still six, uh, yeah. JP, and that, yeah. that, that's really being felt. Yeah, the cost of living for Indigenous communities have always been an issue. Uh, you know, we were in the Torres Strait a number of weeks ago. Lettuce, iceberg lettuce, $9. Wow. Uh, you know, meat is almost un unaffordable for Indigenous communities because yeah. the cost of it is so high. So that cost of living has always been an issue for Indigenous communities. On the fate of Philip Lowe, uh, we're expecting an announcement in the next few weeks. The Treasurer has said it'll happen in July. As I understand it, Cabinet hasn't yet made a final decision on this or who his replacement will be, but all the indications are that he will be uh, replaced. It was interesting, during the week, the Shadow Finance Minister, Jane Hume, really went in a bat for the Governor. I think Philip Lowe is possibly one of the most qualified economists in the country that's seen the economy through some really tough times and that he should be paid due respect for the work that he's done. So you think he should be kept in the role? I, I think that there are very few people out there in Australia that will be as qualified to do this job as Philip Lowe. Laura, what was that about, do you think, the, the support for Philip Lowe there? Oh, it was, it was being nice, I, I thought. <laughs> Nothing more than that? Well, I, I don't know. I haven't spoken to Jane Hume about it. Um, look, um, pragmatically, I don't think Phil Lowe's chances are really all that strong at the moment for um, having another term. The field really is uh, that, you know, has been speculated about is Stephen Kennedy, the head of Treasury, Jenny Wilkinson, the head of Finance, David Gruen, the head of um, the Bureau and Statistics, and the Deputy Governor, Michelle Bullock. Um, I think uh, anybody who knows Jim Chalmers knows much, how much he regards Stephen Kennedy and would want him by his side through what I think he thinks is going to be a really tough period ahead. So if, I don't think Stephen Kennedy is in the running for that reason. We need him here in Canberra would be the view of the government. Mm -hmm. Jenny Wilkinson, um, and also an outstanding public servant um, and uh, also highly regarded by the Treasurer. 
um, and he'd probably want her here as well. There's got to be a lure of appointing the first female governor. Um, David Gruen, you know, another Reserve Bank uh, ex-employee, has done an extraordinary job at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Um, a, you know, a, a really great intellect. I think what will determine what the Treasurer recommends to Cabinet is that it's not just your economics, it's about somebody who has got the force of character and uh, capacity to carry the board to change the institution at the margins, a, a la as, the recommended, yeah. as recommended by the review. And I think that's been a bit overlooked. Everybody's yeah, and, and talking about you know, the politics of it, but it'll be about, you know, boards are important and it's about you know, the powers of persuasion and our leadership that... And when you give that description, I mean, mm. Phil, it's a pretty shallow, narrow mm. uh, group, right, that um, yes. you're talking about who can carry that credibility, lead the mm. Reserve Bank and on this new path of reform. Yeah, that's right. And the other thing Jim Charles has said before, too, is, you know, that, that's got to be a central role of the new governor, and it's sort of fairly well known that Phil Lowe wasn't a big fan of those reforms when they were either proposed or announced, so that was sort of seen as... Mm saying he's not going to get it. I think with the, the Liberals, Jane Hume's not the first one to back in Phil Lowe. He saw Andrew Bragg and Dean Smith, two senators, um, sort of give him a nice shout-out at the end of a committee hearing about a month or so ago and said, we hope to see you back in October. I think there's a view in the coalition uh, that you know, Lowe has been scapegoated to an extent yeah, by the government over the cost of living crisis. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all been the Reserve Bank's fault, what we're going through, you know, because of the way they handled monetary policy during the crisis. The independent Reserve Bank, Phil. Sorry, that one, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we saw the other week where Jim Chalmers agreed with him on one aspect on the same day about the budget not being inflationary, but disagreed with him that mm -hmm. wage, wage rises were potentially inflationary. So there's there's a tension there. Oh, I'm with Laura. I don't think he's got much chance of getting reappointed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. two, two national positions under yeah. a lot of pressure. One is obviously, of course, the RBA governor. The other one is the New South Wales State of Origin coach. So <laughs> if there's a loss this week, it'll be, it'll, it'll be seen which one, 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 one to go. Exactly. <laughs> All right, our panel, uh, John Paul Janke, Laura Tingle and Phil Curry will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with cartoonists for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, the one and only Cathy Wilcox and a very warm welcome. Morning Mike, good to be here. The National Anti-Corruption Commission kicked off this week and it looks like getting knacked is going to become part of our vernacular, <laughs> do you think? <laughs> yes, yes, I feel knackered with the whole topic already. Welcome to the NAC Public Integrity Daycare as the, uh, they're dropping off the, um, the people in nappies here. It's going to be a crowd. They're going to have to, uh, I don't know, put up the fees or something like that to keep people out of there, yeah. I reckon. Referral drop-off zone, I think maybe mm. the Greens. Uh, that's Liberal Blue, right? And uh, Labor car. Yes. Uh, generating a round of sort of not tit for tat, but tit for knack. I suppose. Better draw up a roster for the lollipop duty. It should be... <laughs> Kiss and ride, or kiss your ass goodbye and ride. <laughs> <laughs> kiss your reputation goodbye and ride. I did love Lindsay Foyle. Meanwhile, at the NAC's new headquarters, everybody has been referred to us. Well, that's fair. Just refer everyone. You've got the people who are being referred, and you've got the people who are referring them. Yeah. And our country doesn't have a particularly good reputation for how we treat whistleblowers. Just, no. just saying, just, just putting that out there. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. Mm. Cathy, Philip Lowe uh, didn't go any higher as interest rates were put on hold this week and um, beautiful Matt Golding, the RBA is to announce whether the Australian cricket team standing in London is more respected than Philip Lowe is in Australia, the 13th rate rise man. As uh, the finance report. Nice weaving of nice the cricket into, the cricket into it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's like bold inflation caught excessive profits. Yeah, and Golding can do this in, in the tiniest of spaces. He's economical and astute. There was a touch of uh, Stanley Cross to, to this one, I thought, um, <laughs> Alan Moyer. Good news, rates are on hold as uh, they're, they're <laughs> Aren't hanging we from the all? mortgage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. It'll be Stanley, very cross. Setting world records is usually a good thing, Cathy, but when it comes to global warming, maybe not so much. Uh, we've got this uh, lovely David Pope in the, the red hot corner, we've got El Nino, and mm. on the uh, white corner, we've got CO2 emissions. Guys, wait, mm. I only came here to watch the Musk Zuckerberg cage fight. <laughs> quite worrying. I think the average temperature had raised uh, uh, slightly to 17 degrees. Yeah, which which sounds balmy and pleasant, you know, in a, in a you know, across a year. Yeah. But when you think about the average, um, and it's the average, 
Cathy, uh, John Polly Farmer has uh, drawn the world title today. Most of the heat seemed to be emanating from a game of cricket in England. <laughs> yes, and there's the, there's the shiny hot cricket ball yeah. in, the, in the background. Yep. <laughs> yes. World's hottest day. Cathy, I th this looked to me like you were just having a crisis with everything going on in, in politics no, at the moment. No, no, no. Everything is going just swimmingly. Uh, no politics, the art of the just not possible. Yeah, Gladys is not corrupt. No, we can't just stop approving fossil fuel projects. They can't touch private school funding. You can't remove our incentives for investing in real estate. We can't stop development to protect endangered species. And we can't risk empowering a racial minority, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Cathy, it's been a great pleasure on picking the events this week. I'll let you do the honours. Thanks, Mike. And back to you, David. Kathy, Mike, thank you very much. Let's get some final observations, starting, JP, with you. Well, it's uh, the, the Gama Festival. It's going to be held in a couple of weeks up at uh, North East Arnhem Land on your country. Every year they invite the Prime Minister and the Leader op of the Opposition to come and present. Obviously, this year there's a uh, bigger emphasis on the way forward through the Yes campaign or a national referendum. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition, the program came out, the Leader of the Opposition does not appear in that program, so whether he accepts that invitation to talk to everyone on his way forward is yet to be determined. should note, we'll be there uh, live from Gama at the start of August as well with uh, insiders looking forward to that. Laura? Um, one of the responses from Peter Dutton um, to the uh, Robodet Royal Commission was to say that the, the government was politicising this, which just uh, causes one to reflect on the way Robo debt itself was politicised, or you know, the uh, chasing of welfare fraud victims was politicised, particularly by Alan Tudge. Um, it was fine, apparently, to, you know, really outrageously expose the details of individuals, which turned out not to be right anyway, um, t for political purposes in this. And I suppose I just really reflect on how hard it is going to be to actually change that culture. Of, uh, of, of, of people thinking that welfare is always bad. Phil. Uh, the Royal Commission has showed us just how valuable these processes can be in restoring faith, uh, you know, that there is an accountability there. I think it's now time the Albanese government got off the fence and uh, set up the Royal Commission. They promised us into the handling of COVID. Uh, there's still a lot of, you know, not, not just for the purpose of going after people, but just to, how we well, could do it better it's... next time. I think it's still people looking for answers. And it's not just the federal government's handling, but the states, there's people in Victoria. There's still stuff coming out about the poll-driven responses down there. And I think we're entitled to answers uh, and, and transparency about what went on in COVID and how we could do things better. And the government's been obfuscating up till now, and I think they now got to get on with it. All right. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Finally, as independent journalists, we'd never take our orders from the Prime Minister of the day, unless it involves running an awkward moment to close the show. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. Here in the Hunter, you have an industrial base that's so strong. You'd think with one of my defence ministers here, <laughs> you, you could have uh, timed these things a little bit better, Sorry, Minister no. Conroy. I'm not sure when it's um, when that footage is shown on Insiders at a uh, couple of minutes to ten on Sunday morning. People will realise just quite how loud that was. <laughs> uh, You're making us all feel very excited about being here.